Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we're gonna start out taking a brief poll. So we ask for you all to participate. Uh, so please uh, look at your screen and answer the questions uh, as they come up. Thank you. Thank you. We like to take a moment of silence to reflect and remember those who have lost their lives to traffic fatalities this year. Thank you. My name is Fred Collier. I'm the director of the Cleveland City Planning Commission. And we would like to welcome you uh, to the Vision Zero Action Plan Community Kickoff Meeting. This is an extremely important endeavor to the participants, the city of Cleveland, and all of our partners. Traffic fatalities are a serious problem uh, in our city and throughout our nation and in the world. We have to begin to take seriously the deaths that cars and irresponsible behavior create in our streets and in our communities. The Vision Zero Action Plan team consists of a cross section of stakeholders who are committed to ensuring that Cleveland achieves zero fatalities. I would first like to acknowledge our chair and co-chair of our Cleveland Vision Zero Action Task Force uh, Darnell Brown, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the City of Cleveland, and also Councilman Kerry McCormick, who is Ward Councilman in the City of Cleveland, both who are very much committed on the legislative and administrative side of making sure that Cleveland achieves this goal. What is Vision Zero? Vision Zero looks to bring people together to create clear and measurable strategies to address this issue of traffic fatalities. Our goal is to eliminate serious injuries and fatalities on our city streets. This is very important to the city of Cleveland. It's important for reasons of equity because we understand that vulnerable communities and vulnerable individuals are more subject to serious injuries or fatalities in the city of Cleveland. It's important because we know the pressures that we undertake financially to rethink our streets and to ensure that they're safe and that they prioritize all road users. It's important also because we know the challenges it takes and the perspective transformation required to change the existing culture and attitude of elected officials, decision makers, and people who are on our streets driving in cars and utilizing our roadways. We also know that it's important because we wanna provide options and choice for residents in our city in the 21st century. Some of the work that we're dealing with in Cleveland with respect to Vision Zero is not just a task force of multidisciplinary stakeholders, it's also really mapping out a comprehensive strategy because we know that in order to address this issue, it's going to take the entire system working together under the same value proposition. There are a lot of ways to be involved with the Vision Zero Task, Vision Zero Task Force in the city of Cleveland. You can visit our website, which we will share throughout the program. You can also attend any upcoming community meeting and we would like to thank the participants for coming to this community meeting tonight. We also would encourage you to take the survey. This will help us find out more information about you. And we also wanna make sure that you're plugged into opportunities that we can share later in the program. Tonight, 
we have a special guest with us. And this special guest is someone who is committed to this value proposition. This guest is someone who doesn't just talk the talk, but they walk the walk. And when you hear from this individual, you hear about their lived experience or her lived experience. And we believe that she will inspire you to do better because we all need to do better. Karen Korb is a prominent subject matter expert on the intersection of disability and public health, providing knowledge translation, management coaching, leadership development, and policy analysis with the specific elevation of and commitment to centering the lived experiences and personal narratives of disabled individuals are just a few examples of what makes Ms. Corb a distinguished thought leader in the public health sector. She is deeply committed to the inclusion of persons with disabilities at every level of life and has previously served as the policy and public affairs coordinator for Lakeshore Foundation, an organization devoted to providing opportunities for people with disability to live healthy lifestyles through activity, research, advocacy, and health promotion. She currently serves on multiple boards and advisory councils, including the Alabama FBI Citizens Academy, a friend of mine, Baseline Tennis, the Raw Beauty Health Project, the Health Justice Commons, Alabama Disability Advocacy Program, the Is Able Organization's Advisory Board, the International Tennis Federation, Players Council, and the Sport Integrity Global Alliance General Council and SIGGAS Co Committee on Gender, Race, Diversity, and Inclusion. In 2021, she received a congressional appointment to serve on the Commission on the State of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. She pridefully identifies as a disabled woman who is a full-time wheelchair user. She has many professional sport accolades and is a two-time member of the USA Paralympic team in the sport of wheelchair tennis. Please join me in giving a warm Cleveland welcome to now my hero and hopefully yours, <laughs> Karen Korb. How you doing? Hey, Freddie, thank you so much. What a, you know, every time I, I hear a description of myself, it overwhelms me. I'm like, it's a, it's really just a bunch of stuff. Um, and we all do a lot of really great work and it uh, speaks to the commitment for equity and intentional inclusion for all. So thank you for that uh, warm introduction. I appreciate it so very much. So hello, everyone. Uh, I want to start off with an image description. I'm a disabled wheelchair using white woman with longish multicolored blonde hair and I'm wearing a, a, a deep purple top. I'm also virtually zooming in with you today from the Muncie Lenape lands, also known as New Jersey. And I acknowledge with reverence the Muncie Lenape people, past, present and future, as well as their sacred land on Turtle Island. I wanna thank Vision Zero Cleveland the city of Cleveland, the Cleveland City Council, all of the local agencies, uh, community groups, the Vision, the Vision Zero Task Force. Y'all have done some amazing work. You've been doing this for a really long time. Um, and all those involved in this very remarkable and necessary undertaking. It is my absolute pleasure and privilege to be with you here this evening. Um, and I'm, a pas I'm passionate about many things but none more passionate than the built inclusive environment, the participation and the access for all people to live in the healthiest and safest way they are able. So I'm gonna begin with the, what, it, what actually is a vision for a safe city? Like what is the vision of a safe community? What is the vision of safety for yourselves? And what is the vision of safety for people you care about? Is it having enough money? Is it the simple act of being listened to and heard? Is it comfort? 
Is it a vision of chaos where literally, literally nothing gets done? Or is it a vision of abundance, enoughness, of beauty, of freedom, of unity, and perhaps even the vision of a life worth living in a city or a community or neighborhood where you can simply where you can simply be where you can exist and move around without fear of harm or without fear of being harmed and where you have a sense of of real belonging i have worked with many communities who are considering adopting a vision zero plan when we talk about safety so many of the community questions revolve around the questions are like safety for who safety for who karen safety and safety of what is it roads is it cars is it businesses will it, will it only be safety for the white people in the white neighborhoods because that's how it's always been done or will it truly be safety for all Will the safety for the communities of people who have been historically excluded, will they be prioritized in this process? Maybe. In order for Vision Zero process to be successful, it's gonna take energy and commitment, not only of our notable elected officials, our politicians, uh, and, and obviously I'm aware that you are all having a mayoral election coming up soon and I trust that all of you are gonna get out and vote, right? But more so, it's gonna take a commitment from the people. It's gonna take a commitment from the community. You need to share what you need in order to share the safety aspects of where you live, where you work and where you play. No one, no one knows better than you the people with the authentic lived experiences in our neighborhoods, what you need and what must, what must be prioritized for you and the people you love to experience a safe environment. As you already know, safe mobility is a basic right. It is a basic human right. However, we don't always talk about this. When you are black, brown, queer, disabled, trans, and insert the list of different, the list of historically oppressed people, we know, we know according to our data, that we are disproportionately impacted by traffic deaths and serious injuries. And that having equitable access to safe mobility is something that we must actively advocate for. And I have been doing this for 30 years. And it's not just advocating, it's sometimes downright fighting. So how do we create trusting and accountable relationships? Because you know, we do have the power, even if it doesn't feel that way. It will always be power to the people. I believe all of us are way makers. You know, those not only who make the way for ourselves, but in our own processes of liberation, we are deeply committed to making the way for others. In our time together today or this evening, I want to share with you why this work, and, and by this work, I mean very specifically. The work of prioritizing historically excluded diverse and intersectional populations. It is deeply personal to me. I trust to inspire you to become involved in Vision Zero Cleveland in whatever capacity you may have available. Because quite frankly, we need you. We really need you. And for those of you who don't know, I have not always had a disability. I have not always been a wheelchair user. And let's go back in time and share a little story with you all. I've always been, mm, I've always been a bit um, lively. I grew up in Germany. Uh, my parents, not military, American dream. 
I immigrated over here to the States, but I grew, in, I grew up in Germany in a little town called Heinstadt, which is now called Heimburg. I lived in a very small rural neighborhood and my sister Simone, and yes, I know she has the cooler name, whatever, uh, we would always play in front of the house. And I was about five and we were kicking the ball, you know, like we do, kicking the ball. And the ball went past me. And of course I ran into the street to get the ball, as many kids do. I will give you one guess as to what happened. Yeah, I got hit, I got hit by a car, flattened. That's my car sound. Um, the car ran over me completely and it was mir miraculous that all that happened to me was that my ankle got hurt. And here's something, I was sharing this story with my mother earlier, and here's this part of this story that I did not even know till today. I know what happened as a result of me getting hit by the car, but I did not know what the impetus was that my parents went into action. She said, did you know that that evening, while you were in the hospital, that the gentleman who was driving the car flying down the street came to the house, rang the doorbell and said, you damaged my car. <laughs> my, my parents, they lost it. And here's the crux of this story. As a result, my parents created a neighborhood campaign, which at this time, early 70s, it was literally unheard of, especially because of German culture. German culture, we, we do not question authority. So everything is about the rules. Well, my parents got together with the neighbors that had children and that morphed into conversations with the community, which led to conversations with the city, which resulted in action. It resulted in a speed camera being set it also resulted in a signage ordinance, which is still completely mind blowing to me because, I mean, the signage was uh, the German equivalent of like the children at play signage, right? That we have in our neighborhoods. These signs still exist there today. And I am happy to report no children, no children have been hit and injured since that time. Vision Zero was the goal in our community when it wasn't even Vision Zero yet. So let's fast forward uh, 11 years later. 11 years, so five plus 11 is 16, so 16 and a half. I had a gymnastics accident. I was a gymnast since I was very young. Um, and I became a full-time disabled person, full-time wheelchair user to be specific. And as you all know, there are many different types of disabilities, like many, many different types of disabilities. Uh, and I am here solely sharing about my own lived experience. Everyone with a disability experiences barriers in their own very unique ways. So I was a gymnast and I fell uh, during a vault uh, and I broke six of my vertebrae. And when I hit the mat, I knew I was going to be paralyzed. I was paralyzed. I was like, oh no, here we are. And I became a wheelchair user. So now what, right? Like what, now what? I'm not walking anymore. So I broke my back when I was 16 and a half. And, and some of you may remember when you were 16 and a half, when you emphasized the half, which is definitely, my birthday's coming up this Sunday, 10, 10. Um, the half is not something I emphasize anymore. <laughs> but at the time that half, 16 and a half emphasized that I was going to be getting my driver's license. But after I broke my back, I didn't even know if I was gonna get a driver's license. I didn't know if I was gonna be able to drive. I didn't know if that was gonna be an option for me. I didn't know if that was gonna be an option for me. I didn't know if walking on a sidewalk was gonna be an option for me. I didn't even know if I was gonna literally be anywhere in public. I felt at that time as I was living my life in the meantime. And in, in the meantime, I mean, while in the meantime, while I'm using a wheelchair, I had to figure out how am I going to be part of my community? 
In the meantime, I have to figure out how I'm going to exist in this new body. How am I going to get around? In the meantime, I need to figure out how I'm going to connect with people who may be completely averse to disability. Even current time, people do not like being reminded that disability is a human life experience. I often say this, and some of you in the audience who know me um, know that I say this, whether you're born with a disability, you acquire a disability, you age into a disability, or you've acquired a chronic health condition, perhaps it may even be the physical manifestations of long COVID. What I have learned about disability, it's, it's not an if. Not an if it will happen. It is a when it will happen. Permanent, temporary, or situational. Impaired vision, hearing, mobility, or other challenges. It is a human life condition. What's interesting is with Vision Zero, we have an opportunity to prepare, to create not only safety, but ease. Like we have an opportunity to create ease in our lives, however we show up in our communities. Why wouldn't we want to do that? So often the response when I pose this question is like, Karen, we do not have the resources. Number one, that's the number one answer. We don't have the money. And my response is pretty much the same response. Our civil rights should never be relegated to a cost benefit analysis. We, we determine how we build safer systems. I remember the first time I went out in public in my wheelchair. I was still in, in the hospital and my friend Ray Smaha came to the hospital and he literally physically dragged me out of the room and he said, you have to, you have to get outside, Karen. You have to be in the air. So I broke my back in 1985, which was a bunch of years before the passing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And way before anybody, anybody ever and actually cared what anybody who was different had to say or contribute. There wasn't equity conversations. There were no equity statements back in the day. One of my biggest fears of being out in public was how was I gonna navigate being outside and moving in my wheelchair? How was I gonna navigate the sidewalks? How was I gonna cross the street without getting hit by a truck or getting killed by a car? Fast forward 37 years. I've been a wheelchair user for 37 years now. Endless education, projects, research, focus groups, transportation advocacy, transportation policy. And I'm still thinking about the same things. Anywhere I go, how am I gonna navigate the spaces and places? How am I gonna navigate the sidewalks, especially when there are none? I just moved recently from Alabama. And if you know anything about Alabama, we have very limited sidewalks. How am I not gonna get hit by a speeding car, a truck, a motorcycle, a skateboarder, a skater, and current status for real, scooters? I don't know if y'all know this, but research, wheelchair users have a significantly higher risk of being killed in car collisions than other pedestrians. They found that those who use wheelchairs are not one, are not two, are three times, three times more likely to die in road traffic collisions than the rest of the population. All right. And most of these deaths occur at intersections and locations without traffic controls or crosswalks. I don't know, easy fix, maybe. The research also noted that there was poor pedestrian infrastructure and that the infrastructure was inadequately adapted to people with disabilities. I cannot tell you how many times I have been forced to use the street because there wasn't a curb cut, there wasn't a ramp, or there wasn't a usable sidewalk, but I needed to get 
from point A to point B. Also in three quarters of these crashes, there was no evidence that the driver sought to avoid the crash. And the police reports also showed that drivers frequently failed to give way to those in wheelchairs. Now, that is absolutely my lived experience. Something I experience so often when I'm trying to cross the street. I, I sit there and I'm like, what, am I here? Hi, I'm right here. Really, just going across the street. That's some bias right there. That tells me, that information tells me that people do not necessarily value a disabled person's existence in public spaces. This is one of the reasons I, I also rarely use the subway. I am afraid that someone will think that they are putting me out of my wheelchair life misery and push me in front of an oncoming train. Uh, by the way, my life is not miserable. I have an amazing and brilliant, abundant life. Um, but I do have tremendous anxiety when I'm out in public spaces, especially on a public transportation platform. Woo, y'all don't even know. When you are a part of a minoritized group, you become very, and I mean very aware of your surroundings and your safety. There is such importance that communities build well-designed curb cuts, ramps, and widen sidewalks to enable not only people who use L mobility devices to safely exist, but maybe also having things slow down a little bit. Like let's slow down that traffic a smidge, just like this much. But more importantly, <clears throat> what I know to be true is that when you create an accessible, universally designed environment, everybody benefits not just people with disabilities. The question, the question for me and the question for all of us is how can we work together? <clears throat> the solutions for me <laughs> um, is always becoming involved with like-minded groups of people. Here we are. They wanted to make our local communities safer. I learned how to use the language of the collective of the community, of the neighborhood, joint neighborhood associations. And I also learned the importance of creating trust with leaders in our community. We, we can do this through Vision Zero. We can do this through this process. Our leaders, they have quite a bit to carry these days. But we, we dictate what that actually is. We must communicate, 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 and then communicate some more so we can discover our common values, the common denominator. I use a little math equation. That which we all care about. And you know what happens then? I will tell you. When we do this process, we begin to see ourselves in each other. I wanna bring you another example. It's my bicycle example. And some people are like, you're disabled, how do you, how do you ride a bike? Okay. So I took up cycling in 2013, hand cycling to be specific. And some of you may know what that is and some of you may not. Uh, you know what, let me do something real quick and I'm gonna screen share, hold on just to give you a visual. Let's see, which picture do I have? Where do I look the coolest? Hold on, this one, boom. So right here, this is called a, a recumbent. Um, this is a hand cycle. Um, it's got about 36 gears and Shimano, all kinds of things. Anyway, for those of you who are cyclists in the audience, you get it, right? I know you're thinking like, oh, she's got zip tires on there. Yes, I do. Anyway. I want to go back to my stop share. Hold on, bear with me. Okay. So there's many ways to ride a bike when you become disabled. If you are blind, you can ride a tandem bike with a sighted person or a guide. If you have back issues or you had a stroke, you can ride a recumbent bike uh, where you sit and you pedal in more of a lay down way. Um, and there's types of hand cycles. There is recumbent, um, a lay down recumbent like you just saw. And there's also a hand cycle called a kneeler. 
So there are some amputees, they kneel and they use their chest and their arms to torque the bicycle. Um, I took up riding in 2013 because <laughs> I wanted, um, I wanted for my 45th birthday, I wanted to do a road race called the, at the time, the Saddler Ultra Challenge. And the word ultra should have given it away that it was a seven stage race in Alaska. And the it was touted the longest and most difficult hand cycling race in the world. And um, I also want you to know that at this time, I did not own a bike. I borrowed one from my friend, Paul Walker, who was gracious enough to loan it to me. And I was like, I'm gonna do this race. And I knew nothing about riding my bicycle. <sighs> when I look back at that now, like who, who, uh, who does that, right? Like, what? I wanna share what led up to this race because so much of this is why I do so much of this work right now. I began training in Florida. I was living in Florida at the time in December of 2013, and the race was in July of 2014. Um, I think I forgot, it's a 278 mile race, by the way, from Anchorage to Fairbanks. Uh, every day I would ride my bike in this park called Markham Park in a giant circle. I think it was like a three mile loop and it was flat. And as you may know, Alaska is not flat. I also had on occasion um, to ride on group rides on the road. And let me tell you how scary that was. For any of you who have ever been to Broward County, like Fort Lauderdale area in Florida, that was really scary. I, you know, one of the things about Florida is Florida, Georgia, California, all states of which I have lived in, and they all have respectively the, the highest number of pedestrian fatalities in the thousands. And uh, one of the things I was I had the privilege of doing not too long ago was working with the municipal planning organization of uh, Florida, uh, Broward County to be specific. And I was in Florida last week and I cannot tell you the changes that have occurred. My friends, it is, it is doable. Like, it is doable in a collective, we can do this. I also wanna share when I was working in uh, Jefferson County in Alabama, in Birmingham, I became part because of cycling. I became part of what was called the Jefferson County Health Action Partnership. And we worked on a complete, a complete streets policy for five years. And five years is like nothing in terms of planning mentality. But for me, I was like, are we ever, what's, are we ever gonna pass this? Can I ever ride on the road? And my contribution with many of my disabled riders was to create an inclusive complete streets policy. I am really proud of this. We were able to pass this complete streets policy in the city of Birmingham unanimously. The city council passed this policy unanimously for the first time in about 12 years, a unanimous passing. You all know, this is, this is, a, this is rare. This doesn't happen. Why I share that is because I know, and I'm gonna keep saying it, I know that this is possible. And there are those of you in this audience that know this is possible too. That's why we do this. We wanna save lives and we wanna create abundance. We wanna create neighborhoods and communities where we want people to move to. So this is why I do what I do. I have the privilege of working with so many different groups around the country who are actively, I mean actively trying to figure out the very best ways to create communities where all people can move about safely and not just live, not just live, hang out, but thrive, because there's a difference. Where we can thrive regardless of who you are and how you move. So this conversation is not about me. It's, it's about all of us. 
When we think about active transportation planning, believe it or not, people are centered in this conversation. And perhaps you're thinking, I, girl, I've been to meetings. <laughs> they don't care. They aren't listening to me or my concerns. A mayor, elected official, politician, who doesn't get it perhaps, broken promises, an upcoming election where it's the you know, same old, same old. It may not always seem that people are centered with so many other things and organizations involved. Each and every one of us wanting our own piece of the transportation pie, so to speak. We need to reframe the vibe. We need to reframe the vibe. Yes, we absolutely have a right to safety and safe mobility. But perhaps in the spirit of, of humanity, we can create some space to think about our obligation because it is always bigger than ourselves. In my own process, I'm always thinking about other people and if, if I'm creating harm. We have an obligation to serve the past, the present and future generations. And you know what? The planet, the planet herself. This is what I affirm for our entire community. The people who live here, our city planners, the politicians, our elected officials, our neighbors, our mayors, our police chiefs, transportation and public health professionals, community leaders, our loved ones, those who have died unnecessarily, those who own cars, those who ride bicycles or scooters, those who use the bus or the train, black, brown, indigenous, disabled, gay, queer, trans women, men, older, younger children, and anyone who I may have missed. What I affirm for all of you is what I affirm for all of us is that We are tender enough to feel. We are present enough to witness that we are humble enough to really listen, like to really listen and participate, that we are courageous enough to act and be accountable be accountable enough to create real change, like real sustainable change that benefits all of us and generations to come. I'm gonna leave you with these final thoughts. And this, this isn't necessarily just about vision zero. This is about our lives. You and me, we, we all have to participate in our own rescue. And whatever we're not actively changing, we're actively choosing. And there's a difference between telling somebody what to do and inviting them to a new idea. With Vision Zero Cleveland, we are inviting you to a new idea. I want to thank you all this evening for the very precious gift of your attention. And I very much look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. I don't know who's next. <laughs>
<laughs> Ready, unmute. David's next. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're all fired up and ready to take action, you know, based on the inspiring and, and also very real um, opportunities that you outlined. So with that in mind, um, talking about real opportunities, I just want to briefly share before we get into Q&A with everyone, um, the opportunities that you all have um, to get involved. So I'm just gonna share my screen here real quick. So uh, first of all, I just wanna say uh, as by way of introduction, my name is David Jerka and I'm working on uh, the fabulous team here with Nelson Nygaard and the city of Cleveland on the Vision Zero Action Plan um, on my team. Uh, I'm also really happy to have uh, Roberta Duarte from Areco Consulting, Ben Herring from Page Studio, and uh, a few phenomenal street team leaders, uh, Sonia Matis, Lakita Worley-Bell, Ronetta Stallworth. Um, and uh, you'll probably see more of us out here on these uh, community events. So, um, we hope you come up and say hi and, and you talk to all of us. Uh, so uh, one of the immediate next steps that we have available is to attend one of uh, eight community events. Um, these are located all throughout the city. Most of them are actually on the east side of Cleveland on east side neighborhoods. Um, these eight events are listed here on the right. Um, you don't have to memorize them all right now. You can give it a quick scan and see which location might be most convenient and close to you. Uh, but all of these uh, locations and the RSVP, RSVPs for the locations are available on the Vision Zero website. Another way that you can get involved is to share your ideas via an online survey. Uh, the survey is relatively quick, but also gives you a lot of opportunities to get in depth uh, with your comments and basically help us prioritize next steps for the Vision Zero action plan and work. Um, again, these two action items, uh, both RSVP for an upcoming community event and take the online survey. Both are available on visionzerocle.org. Uh, easy one-stop shop to get connected and get involved. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna open it up and, and hand it off uh, to facilitating questions. Thanks. All right, thank you, David. You know, at the beginning of the program, I mentioned, Karen, that <laughs> you're my hero. Uh, but after hearing um, your testimony, uh, it was even more inspiring. And I just want to say, you know, we're humbled to have you and uh, for you to be so authentic, you know, with sharing your experience. We just want you to know we humbly and sincerely appreciate you for everything that you have done and that you're a living testimony of what you believe. So we appreciate that. Uh, my task here is to engage you in the Q&A uh, with our uh, audience members, um, but I'm going to take some liberty because <laughs> uh, I have a question uh, myself. I was so inspired by a couple of things that you said, and uh, I wanted to highlight a couple of those things and, and then uh, kind of pose my question. You had uh, mentioned um, uh, when we are uh, not acting, are actively changing we are actually uh, choosing by not taking action. Um, that really touched me uh, pretty deeply. And um, thinking about people other than ourselves, um, that's uh, very difficult in today's world. And uh, we live in a culture where people are not thinking about themselves. And the other thing that I uh, picked up from what you were saying, um, because of your lived experience, you know, people tend not to really understand the gravity of something till it hits home. So from your perspective, why do you think it takes tragedy for the system to act? And why can't, or what do you think the hurdles are to us being more proactive? Does it have to be tragic? 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Freddie, for that um, question and your compliments. I really appreciate that. No, it doesn't necessarily doesn't have to be tragic, like to address that first. And um, we are a society and there's a lot of psychology behind this because we're, we're basically very predictable types of people. Right. We have compartmentalized ourselves in, um, you know, I'm a man, I'm a woman and and I'm disabled or I'm non-disabled. I am black. I am white. And and when you do some deep studies, when you, when you study critical race theory, when you take a look at our history. Uh, you begin to see these oppressive systems that we have all benefited from. We have all benefited, especially as a white woman, I have benefited from my skin color tremendously. And there are so many, we, people don't want to admit that. We, we really, we are addicted to our comfort. Mm -hmm. And any time that we're taking out of our comfort, uh, we think it's a personal affront. And that, that is not the case. I mean, this is about collect, all of this, all of our process, all of the processes are about collective liberation. And if I receive my liberation and any one of my siblings doesn't, that, that's not collective liberation. People are very uncomfortable with the collective often. Um, I often pose a question in audiences. I said, let me see a show of hands. Uh, and I, I have to give credit. Um, Charles T. Brown, who is an equity expert mm -hmm. um, out of Rutgers, he uh, is the founder of Equitable Cities. He, he did this and he did this with color. He asked the audience, who in this room would like to be black? And nobody raised their hand. Mm. I stole it. I stole that example because I was like, whoa, that is so profound. I said, who in this room wants to be disabled? No, but no, no, nobody raised their hands. Mm. And what I thought about that, and this is based on his example. You know, I remember him leaning into the audience. He said something along the lines of, you cannot claim ignorance mm. about what is happening to people who are different. Right. It is apathy. We are choosing to either be silent or not be active in these conversations that create and facilitate change. Yes. And that's where we need to be. It is a process because of our addiction to comfort. Yeah. I mean, I, and I could literally talk about this for days, <laughs> truly. No, I, I feel that, you know, and, you know, we talk a lot here, you know, about changing the culture and, you know, changing perspective and, you know, value proposition you know, and, you know, determining sort of really what is our value proposition and how are you living up to that? You know, we were talking earlier about equity being in the transaction. So how do you demonstrate that? So these are all key things that I think is going to be important for us here locally uh, to really start living that out. I have a question from the chat that I would like to share with you. Um, and this question is from uh, Drusilla. It says, Karen, uh, this question is the Q&A for you, Annie, uh, from Annie Pease, I believe. It says, could you share more about the Broward County example in Florida? What did you remember most about the place of the past and what improvements stood out to you most? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, this came to me, I was doing work, uh, or I do work, I'm a faculty with the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. They're what they call the Walking Action Institute. And for the past two years, I believe we've been doing that virtually. And part of this curricula, and I get to, and this is not just me doing this work, this is a group of astounding faculty members. Um, and Karma Edward Harris leads this uh, through the NACDD. What we do is an inclusive walk move audit. Okay. And part of these groups that come to the Walking Action Institute are uh, an interdisciplinary group right, where usually we have an elected official, um, city planner, engineer, um, people active transportation representation, and it's a, probably about a group of five or six from respective communities. So it wasn't just Broward County, like we many different many different areas, and we most recently did uh, rural cities, Arkansas. Anyway, so what I recall about the Broward County group was uh, there, there was always. Like there's always discord, right? There's this, well, you don't understand my job because I'm the engineer. I'm like, no, you know what? You're right. <laughs> I do not understand. But what happened was 
we, we go on these inclusive walk, move audits where we, and it's led by Mark Fenton. So we go around the neighborhood, we, we choose an area and we go in groups and each of these groups have someone with a disability, a discernible disability assigned to the group. So I'm assigned to a group, um, my, my colleagues, um, Vincent, who's a bilateral amputee, is black man, wheelchair user, a right. friend who has a cognitive disability, um, also a person who's blind. So you get different experiences. But what happens in these experiences is that you center the lived experience of the person. Yes. And so with the Broward County example, I was kind of moving down the sidewalk and it was me and the, and the traffic engineer. Right. And we got to an intersection and I had to traverse the area in a, like a three quarters of a mile in a different way mm. where the rest of the group could just cross. And I said, help me understand this. And he went down this whole compliance conversation. And I said, look at me. Does this make any sense to you at all? Mm. You know, compliance is a very low level. How do we not get sued conversation? <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> it's just, it, that's what it is to me. Um, it doesn't make sense, though. I would really like to just cross the street right here. That's that's how jaywalking got started. Like, you know, why would I walk all the way around here or move across the area in this way? Mm. Let's fast forward to now in Florida. The things that I noticed this past week, oh, my gosh, not only how beautiful mm. the curb ramps were and the side, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the sidewalks were, <coughs> but the... um they call them the um <clears throat> the rapid flashing beacons mm -hmm. oh. and i will tell you i was in um uh heading into west west palm beach county and going into broward and i was driving along the beach because i was having a moment i was like oh relaxation for five minutes and i noticed that i got a little annoyed mm -hmm. with every few hundred feet that there was this rapid flashing beacon. I'm like, <sighs> slowing me down. I want to get home. And then I took a moment and I said, Karen, this is, are you kidding me? This is saving people's lives. And I thought about the work. I think, and then I thought about all the people that were involved in this process. But these were the things that were so noticeable to me. And then when I went to the beach the following day, I used one of those crosswalks. All the cars stopped. It was miraculous to me. Like, oh my God, people are like, they are paying attention and I'm not going to die today crossing right. this street. So, right. so to answer your question, I think it was Annie. Um, yeah, those are the things that were very significant, but it came with a lot of work. It wasn't just, hey, we're going to do this. No, 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 no. It never is. It mm. never is. Man, you know, <laughs> uh, another thing that you said, because uh, you, you had some really uh, interesting uh, statements that I think people can really resonate and feel. So I appreciate you keeping it 100 with us and honest. Um, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, but bear with me, right? You indicated that safety, our safety should not be viewed through the lens of a cost benefit analysis. That was beautiful. <laughs> and there's some people who need to hear that <laughs> uh, here locally. So can you elaborate on that uh, yeah. for a moment? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. <clears throat> People tend to pick up on that quite a yeah. bit <laughs> because it really does. I mean, for all of us uh, in the audience and, and, and people that I talk to, when I say it out loud, there, you know, the reaction I get is like, did she, did she just say that out loud? I'm like, oh, yes, I sure did. I sure said it. Um, when you are a, a person um, with a disability or you're a per person from, um, who is minoritized and, and because you don't, you're not born a minority. Like our social constructs minoritize us. These are our oppressive systems. So it's not personal. These are things that have existed for a very, very long time. And when you have not been included intentionally at the front end, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what it is, it, whether, it, whether it's um, a complete streets policy or uh, you know, getting your hair appointment or um, making a building accessible or uh, registering for your classes. Mm -hmm. If you are a person who doesn't have access in the way that historically people have access. And when I say historical, I, I really mean white, cis, hetero men. 
I mean, that is the data. This is not something I'm going, hey, let me, oh, you know, mm, what is that? No, that is not what I'm talking about. These are the facts. And when you have a lack of diversity, and I know we throw that word around a lot. The D in diversity is disability, by the way, in case you were wondering. Uh, when you don't have diverse populations in your leadership, you know, all roads lead to this status quo. Yeah. And then there's conversations about how are we going to calculate your existence? Uh, because we don't have money for that. Well, <laughs> in my opinion, my very humble opinion, uh, that's not on me. Y'all didn't include us in the first place. So figure it out. Right. And that is critically important because I feel very strongly that it will happen because I believe it's power to the people. Collective liberation is that. We are witnessing this experience everywhere and we're also witnessing the resistance. Mm -hmm. If you are a person who has never feared for your life in a public space, mm -hmm. you might want to do a little research. You might want to get a little personal education. That's right. I don't know everything, Freddie. Like, I really don't. But what I do know about myself is that I am committed to learning and not just learning, but unlearning, mm. unlearning. Mm. And there are many ways to go about doing this. I will never labor my siblings who are different than me mm. in this work. The emotional labor that it takes to do this work, to teach people is insurmountable. So if there's something that I don't know, I'm going to do a deeper dive because I don't want to labor my people who have been oppressed in with multiple identifiers. And I, and as you can tell, I get really, I get, I'm really passionate about it because I have lived with incredible privilege in my life. Right, right, right. And you've also experienced what it means to be in the minority, you know, and, and I think that's huge. You know, yeah. that's where the relatability comes, you know, comes in. Yeah, I think, I think it's important to know. I mean, one of the things about uh, our movements and justice, I am, I am not a person of color. I'm not gay. I'm not any of the things that multiply marginalized people experience. But I want to be the best ally in this space that I possibly can. And that relates to justice. Yes. So we have, a, we have disability justice. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, part of that is if you are a person that experienced privilege, get out of the lane. Here you go. You know, pass the mic. There's all kinds of expressions for it. But, you know, we really need to live that experience. Yes. Yes. And I'd like to believe that I do that. You know, am I the best at it? No. I have so much to learn. But that's the point. The humility. Like I said in the end of my keynote, I mean, the humility piece, the grace, mm -hmm. the participation of humanity, mm -hmm. to me, is, is the most important thing. Absolutely. There's a question in the chat from Jerry Severga. Yeah, hopefully I'm not butchering your last name, um, but I'm gonna read this question because it's pretty okay. uh, intriguing here. Okay. Uh, so he's with the American Heart Association and he states that many of our members, volunteers and staff are very passionate about improving street safety and designing roads for the safety of all users. We were excited to learn that the city uh, was considering updating their complete and green streets policy and appreciate you taking, uh, talking about the efforts in Al Alabama. Can you share more about how policies like complete streets align with the goals of Vision Zero? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Jerry, for asking that question. I think it's important to note that we often center, I mean, where they're similar is that both of these initiatives and these, this process uh, centers people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we receive that as these things do not center people because who's usually up close and personal? We see our elected officials, our administrators, our city council, our mayors, or however your city is built um, in the forefront. But what we fail to understand, and this is something that I learned by doing this work, was that you matter. It was... Uh, as a disabled person in this space, the city council in Alabama, they, they didn't know that disabled people ride bikes. Like they, they didn't know, you know, they think they're doing a great job. 
-hmm. with our transportation systems. Mm -hmm. But you know what? If your sidewalk is broken, you are, you are not getting to the bus stop, mm -hmm. right? And we don't, so my point is, they are very similar and they center the lived experience of human beings, of people and their safety. And it's not just about a complete streets policy. And that's where it's different mm -hmm. because complete street policy is a component of Vision Zero. And I have a lot to say because, you know, they don't come, complete streets does not come without its flaws. Like I have not talked about policing. Mm -hmm. Like I have not talked about implementation. People will lose their minds, right? So there's, there's a lot of things to discuss here. And that's why people are very um, yeah. emotional and heightened. Yes. Because safety means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But again, I go back to, to these, you know, Complete Streets and Vision Zero. Ultimately, this is about saving lives and creating an environment where we can thrive, really. Yes. Um, but not all roads lead to the one. And that's why I talk about communicate. We gotta communicate. We gotta beat it up, communicate. We gotta eye roll. We have, we have to have good facilitators who can do the knowledge translation and perhaps be gentle in the space where this hand can explain to this hand, mm -hmm. so to speak, you know, what they're talking about, you know, and provide communication in different ways mm -hmm. because we hear language very differently. Yes, yes. And, you know, it's funny you say that because, uh, you know, this, this urgency, right, to get it done, you know, um, and there's not the TLC that's required to listening to people and understanding perspective, you know, that's often left out of the equation because you're pressed for, uh, you know, time, money, or something that uh, distorts the ability to communicate effectively and to reach an understanding and for people to get an understanding of interest outside of their own. I think that is, to your point, something that I think uh, culturally has to shift in order to get to a point where you can, you know, create the conditions uh, or equitable conditions for everyone, you know, because there's always that disjointed, you know, self-interested posture, you know, that many people take. Uh, I got another question for you. Yeah. This is from Elena. Um, she says, the point you make uh, about disability not being an if, this is good. I had this one written down too, Elena. Great question. An if, but a when is spot on. And no one knows the moment that something will happen that is the tipping point. Karen has testified, and I can attest as well, uh, because she too is disabled, that it only takes an instant for your life to change. I feel it falls on us to do the due diligence to make our city accessible for all. So that wasn't a question, but it was an endorsement and a t uh, somewhat of a, uh, a testimony. Thank we you, Elena. To to Elena. Or yeah. Alana, I'm not sure. <laughs> right, right. I, I, um, yeah, and, and again, uh, framing disability as as pitiable and, and charity and tragedy is is not what our what is not what our lives are right now. Those are perceptions based upon the representation that we witness and experience on television and in books, mm -hmm. and the list goes on. When we create accessible places and spaces, you're going to you're going to experience more disabled people, and more so with long COVID, people have not even wrapped their brains around this yet. <laughs> because it's going to happen. Our pace of life, there's gonna be parts that are accelerated and there are gonna be parts that are slowed down. Mm -hmm. you know, and also talking about what you shared earlier, uh, before, but just before this comment is, um, Freddie, like we, we all have expansion work to do. Mm -hmm. like you can't transcend what you don't recognize. If you're an alcoholic and you don't recognize you're an alcoholic, well, uh, nothing's gonna happen, however, when you can recognize all of us, all of us, we have our own introspection and expansion to attend to. Yes. We are, you know, and I can, can, can go off on this, but, you know, we're, re, we're living in a very dense three-dimensional environment right now. And we are also operating 
in a technological sphere, mm. artificial intelligence, okay, things are being accelerated. Yes. And because we are very human, we are very fear-based often in, these, in this process. And so we don't slow ourselves enough down mm -hmm. to really listen and learn from a this way, mm -hmm. from a this perspective. And I am a big fan. I mean, I work with so many people and they're like, oh, God, you know, I got to meditate, Karen. I got, ooh, I just dropped my earring. I got to meditate. Can you teach me how to meditate? So I do a lot of work in the space of meditation facilitation and just facilitation in general, people really wanna know what that secret is. And, and there really isn't a secret to slowing your breath down for 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. You need to do it. Yes. <laughs> yes. You, you just need to stop and do it. Absolutely. Here's something I wanna share and then I wanna uh, go to another question in the chat. So um, fatal crashes from 2016 to 2020. Um, it showed in the uh, illustration, 47% are speed related. Uh, for me, that translates into attitude, right? Attitude about the role. Um, it also states that 33% of fatal crashes have alcohol use as a documented contributing factor. That to me denotes the lack of personal responsibility and concern for others. So when we think about the attitude of road users, the lack of empathy for individuals who use our right of ways, how would you say we need to go about addressing that within our community? How does that perspective transformation happen? How do we get people to understand that every time they get on the road, whether they're in a car or other type of device, that it's not just their life that they're putting in uh, their hands, they're impacting the lives that could potentially impact the lives of other people. How do you, how do, you do that? Because I love what you said uh, with your parents, how they acted, right? And it's unfortunate that it took that experience, you know, for that to happen. But it's a, it's a blessing, you know, that it did because a lot of good and you're doing a lot of good as a result. So just tell me your thoughts about how you can get people to change their minds. Um, I, listen, I listen a lot, uh, which is, is something that we uh, collectively have a hard time doing. Mm -hmm. um, we also, we're also helpers. Um, we wanna fix things that may not necessarily be broken. Mm. Um, also, a, a lot of these, when we, when we talk about, you know, there are places where you can drive fast, right? There are places where you can go where you can drive your vehicle fast, just not in a 20 mile an hour zone, right? Or a school zone. We all have been socialized to know that if you are in a 15 mile, if you're in a school zone, you're not smoking weed, right? Out, outwardly, and you're not speeding because right. we know what can happen, right? It's not necessarily we're gonna hurt a child, but what we can be arrested, mm -hmm. right? Police, going back to the policing issue, but that's not the point. Why do we, I mean, let's think about, there's so many reasons why we speed. Mm -hmm. Why do I speed? I don't know, I hit the snooze button 18 times. Right. And so often when people are rushing me to do things, I, I have strong boundaries around this. And uh, uh, <laughs> I always, you know, and some of you have heard this expression before. I'll say your lack of prep preparation does not constitute an emergency on my part. Hmm. So creating empathy is, I really believe, is a lifelong project. It's a lifelong purpose, I know for me. Um, but even addressing where we, again, going back to the introspection, like where do we fall short? How can I be a better human being? And you know what? At the end of the day, Freddie, we cannot, and I say this a lot as well, like we cannot legislate attitudes. Right. People show up the way they show up. Right. And we can, eat, we can do one of two things. We can dismiss 
Mm -hmm. I insert eye roll. Oh, there's fill in the blank again, doing what they do, right? Mm, mm -hmm. Eye roll and whatever. Or we can acknowledge them as a human being that hasn't gotten to this place yet. And you know what? Neither have we. Right. Like recognizing our reciprocal humanity is really important because I like being mad at people. I promise you, I'm, I'm not a lot. It's a righteous rage that I have. And then I had to calm down and uh, know that it is in the collective that we're going to get places. So how am I going to create an opportunity? Not just for me, but for the person or the people to understand the message in the way they understand the message, mm -hmm. not necessarily my own agenda. Right. For example, I mean, I, I always give the Title IX example. Title IX giving women and girls the opportunity to participate in sport. So I'm an athlete, and so I think this way. You know, Title IX didn't get passed because of women. It got passed because of fathers who had daughters. Mm -hmm. And we need to think about that. Like, I don't always, let me get out of the lane. I was doing some work in Trinidad, Tobago, not that long ago. And it was an all-male sports ministry. And we were trying to create inclusivity in the schools. And I said one sentence in a meeting, and I got shut down. And me and my feminist self, I was like, oh, my God, I'm about to throw the table. But what I realized in that moment, I was like, take it away, Paul. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes that's what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. You need, I needed to defer to someone else to carry the message for me. Right. Right. And again, it goes back to the introspection piece. Wow. You know, <laughs> one thing I'll, I'll say, and I'll go to this question, you know, uh, we can legislate and regulate behavior. And I think that's where uh, street design and looking at how we uh, control for these things, I think is important. Because uh, you mentioned we're in a rush all the time. We need to slow society down a bit, you know, and I think by designing and creating the conditions, we can help contribute to that on top of everything that you just articulated. So thank you for that. That was amazing. Um, I want to go to Lee, uh, Lee Chillicott. Um, based on your experience, how do cities gain buy-in and accelerate the pace of real change? Uh, Cleveland has made tremendous strides, but it's uh, frustratingly uh, behind in building complete and green streets. There's that of uh, completing green streets again. Guess what, Lee? You, he, Cleveland is not alone. Um, these are conversations I'm having, uh, and many of us are having with a lot of different people, groups, city admins um, all over the country, and, and not just the country, but the world. So these are conversations we're having everywhere, and, and that's the point. Like, there is so much educating that we need to do. Half the time people, they don't know what complete, like why are these lanes here? Like, what, what is that? Um, most recently I was in Hoboken, which is, uh, I'm about 15 minutes currently, 15 minutes outside of Manhattan. And one of the places I like to go is Hoboken. They have an incredible complete streets policy, but, but they also refurbish their entire neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and so their complete streets uh, areas are also in certain areas are enclosed. So what I'm witnessing there is, not just cyclists, but chair users, hand cyclists, strollers, rollerbladers, skateboard, like everybody is using this area and it's, it's normalized to be in these, these spaces. Um, yeah, we, to go back to your question, Lee, um, it just, it takes, I say just uh, loosely, uh, it, it takes a lot of effort um, and <laughs> calm effort dare I say, and I'm not always calm. I'm not always like this, I'm, I'm highly charged. Uh, I will create a hardcore boundary around anyone who disrespects the people that I work with or the initiatives that we're trying to bring forward. But I will, I will inundate you with information and I will get the right people on our teams to bring the message forward the way, again, like I said earlier, the way, the way that group will hear it because we assume things about each other. Mm -hmm. We all have our unconscious and very conscious biases. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and, and a lot of us don't, we don't want to talk about that. It's like, uh, political correctness. And, and, you know, we say all these things, but I'm, you know, this is about accuracy yeah. of how we show up in places and what our experiences are. And not everyone's going to agree. And so how do we create diplomacy when perhaps diplomacy doesn't exist? How do we create the energy and the momentum yeah. around our climate issues? Yeah. Like we have, we've got big things that we're working with right now. Um, and it's literally one step at a time. And I know people don't necessarily want to hear that. Like there are people who have been doing this work for 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. You know, policy change takes a long time to change. And I'm going to say this. Um, it's a bit crass, but I'm going to say it. Uh, it takes so long to change because we have leaders. Who, they're not dying. <laughs> right and when things change is because we have segments of leadership that go away mm -hmm. and then they're infused with mm -hmm. new generations and new visions and so we just got to keep at it yeah, and eventually yeah. eventually we're going to get there we are going to get there i believe that right right and, you know i always say i use this example you know we're all trying to climb the same mountain don't tug on my leg <laughs> And we're right? in the same direction, you know, so that's, I think that's interesting. Uh, that's important. So uh, it's 720 and I believe it's time to transition. I just want to say to you, Karen, uh, this has been an honor and a pleasure uh, to be a part of this conversation and to have gotten an opportunity to meet you, um, hear your story. Uh, you're one of the most uh, sincere and authentic uh, individuals I've had the opportunity to engage with. Um, in a form like this. So I just appreciate uh, your candor and I'm sure our audience uh, has benefited greatly uh, from your, your, uh, your lived experience and your story. And we hope that you continue uh, to be a friend at Cleveland and engage with us. Um, and I'm Definitely. gonna turn it back over to David and just thank you so much. My pleasure. And I'm really grateful for all of your efforts in this space. I mean, it really, it takes a collective to create that liberation. And um, I really trust this process. We may not like it and it may be slow, but we're gonna make it, we're gonna do it. Thank you, Freddie. Well, thank you again, Karen. Thanks so much um, for the presentation. Uh, Freddie, thanks for facilitating um, the dialogue, you know, in our uh, virtual spaces today. Um, I thought that that went really well. And thanks to everyone who participated, who shared comments and questions, and also shout out to our ASL interpreters. Thank you. You guys, uh, that was fabulous. Um, so I'm just going to quickly remind everyone again of the opportunities to get involved coming up right now. We have the two items again. Uh, please share this with friends, with folks that you think uh, might be interested that couldn't participate thus far. Attend a community event. It's a great way to get in touch, to build the social networks, to um, build you know these coalitions to kind of get change to happen in your community or neighborhood. Again, share your feedback via the online survey. Uh, it's a great way for us to get your concerns documented, so we can see what are the real priorities for residents of Cleveland and get it incorporated into the recommendations that uh, we're all working on. And then I'll also say for those um, that might want to watch this again or share this with, with a friend or, or someone that wasn't able to watch, you know, the, the session's recorded and we'll make it available uh, and we hope that it gets spread far and wide. Um, again, the next action item tomorrow, if anyone's interested at Zone Rec Center, uh, 6301 Lorraine Avenue, uh, we're going to have our first community event. Then the second one is the following day. So on Thursday at Luke Easter Park, uh, all of these sessions, by the way, are going to be outdoors uh, in pavilions or covered locations. So they're happening rain or shine. Uh, we're going to hold them and we'll be there. Um, and again, for COVID safety, we're planning to have these outdoors um, just, you know, for your uh, information. Uh, and this is only the first round. We'll have a second round of meetings as well. Um, so these aren't your only chances to participate if any of these dates don't work for you. Of course, we'll, we'll be back with um, the next round of recommendations so you can be a part of the process. Okay. 
Well, thanks again. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else to be added, but if not, again, let's think of this more as uh, the beginning of this part of the conversation. And uh, if you guys have your little uh, cl <laughs> clap icons, if anyone, I've seen people already share them, uh, let's uh, give uh, Karen uh, our gratitude and a, a round of applause uh, for participating and joining us today. Thanks again, everybody.